The colour I'd like to experiment with today is Michael Harding's In Down Throne Blue Oil Colour. I don't know if that's how I'm supposed to pronounce it, but that's me having a bash at In Down Throne Blue. So uh, correct me in the comments, folks, if you know different. So here's the blue spread out on a transparent, well, a white palette, so that you can see the transparency of it. And my first impression is it's super dark. It looks like a black in its raw format. Um, and when I spread it thinly, it's a very vivid, rich, slightly reddish blue, possibly. So I thought to get to know it a bit better, I should probably compare it with it's blue friends that I know a bit better. So I've put out some ultramarine blue in pure form, phthalo blue and Prussian blue here on the edge of the palette. And to each of them, I've added a little white paint to see how they look um, when they're flattened out with a bit of titanium white number two. So here we have the ultramarine moving to a slightly more violet shade. I would say there's it's definitely a red note in ultramarine blue, especially when you add the white to it. And you can see in its raw, format, it's not as black, so the Indanthrone is definitely quite a lot darker than Ultramarine, and also darker than Thalo, I would say. So these two still have quite a lot of richness, luminosity in the colour in their pure form, uh, whereas the Indanthrone, it's really dense, dark colour in pure form. Um, and then the Prussian, I would say, is as black as the Indanthrone. But if I look at them with the white added, I can see Thalo Blue is much more green biased than Ultramarine. And Prussian is also much more green biased, but slightly greyer, I would say. It's like a blacker, greyer version of Thalo. So if I add some white to the Indanthrone, that's interesting. It seems to soften it, it kind of greys it somehow. It looks richer um, without white in it. The colour looks much more saturated without the white, but once I add the white to it, I can see that it's blacker, greyer, more neutral than the ultramarine. And it almost, it still, it still sort of seems to retain a redder or more neutral blue note. So it's not swinging towards green like the Thalo and the Prussian are, but it is less saturated than ultramarine. So I guess it fills a gap here, doesn't it? It's like the Indanthrone is to the ultramarine what the Prussian is to the Thalo. So if Prussian is like a greyer, blacker, darker version of Thalo. I guess this Indanthrone is like a greyer, blacker, darker version of Ultramarine in a way. I can see exactly kind of where it fits now in, in the scheme of the blues. I haven't bothered putting out Cerulean or Cobalt because they're so much lighter and this is obviously such a dark blue. I thought I'd compare it with other dark blues. So if I add more white, let's get some of this out of the way. If I add some more white to it, let's see where it goes making a pretty usable blue-grey. I've got to say that's very handy for a cloud, maybe, or um, just shadow planes. I would think this is going to be a really useful blue for just getting a, a kind of neutral shadow blue-grey. That's going really easily towards something I could see in a storm cloud or cast shadow on a white building, uh, possibly even useful in flesh tones for creating shadow planes. Okay, yeah, it's definitely useful, but it's it's strong. I'm having to add quite a lot of white to get it to lighten up. And I would imagine with a bit of a red or a brown, it would make a pretty, pretty good neutral gray pretty quickly. Though I don't know, it's very blue. You know, it's still quite strong. Um, let's try it just with a, a tiny bit of this transparent oxide brown I've got here. Okay, it's going greener, it's going to, to a sort of soft green-grey. Very lovely. Gosh, the blue's just eating it though. <laughs> I've just got a smudge of blue in there and it's, it's really strong, powerful colour. But that's great, right? Especially if you want it for glazing, it's going to go a long way. Okay, so how about if I try it now just with that blue on its own and see what kind of black it black it makes, sorry, with the brown on its own. See what kind of black it wants to make. So there it is, the transparent oxide brown, really strong, beautiful, rich red brown. And let's try some Indanthrone blue with it. 
it's gone super black. Let me spread it out and see what I've got. Oh, it's a kind of green black. It's a nice olive green black. Not dissimilar to what I would get with transoxide red and ultramarine, I guess, but stronger, blacker. Um, yeah, it's quite a usable black, that. Okay, yeah. It's almost like a very, very dark raw umber colour, mixing those two together. But definitely quite a strong green note in that. So how about purples? I want to see what kind of purples it will make. So I'm trying it with, with pure magenta, beautiful, rich, transparent colour here. So there's a big pile of magenta and let's try a little bit of blue. Gosh, the darkening effect is incredible, isn't it? Just turns so inky dark the minute I put it into the mixture. It's almost difficult to see what colours I'm getting because it's so dark. So if you're glazing with this, a little is going to go a really long way. And it's interesting because it's very saturated in these dark values. Quite often you lose the colour when you take things down to really dark values, but this actually is retaining. It's making a really lovely rich purple, kind of velvety, beautiful purple, but it's so dark. Let's try a bit of white. So it's not quite as saturated as like a dioxazine or a deep purple or an amethyst. It's just kind of like you dialed it down just one notch from those really pure purples, but it's still really clean. It's not like a plummy purple at all. It's making a really good, rich, strong, clean purple. I wonder if Brilliant Pink, which has a redder note to it, I wonder if that will make a more earthy plum purple with it. So there's the Brilliant Pink on its own. I'm learning here, I'm going to use a tiny bit now of this blue, it's like rocket fuel. So I'm going to put a tiny bit in and see what happens. Okay, that's more controllable. Let's try a little bit more, I'll sneak up on it. So it's going to a sort of dark mauve. Interesting colour and it's got an intensity to it that I don't know quite how I would match that with other colours at that value. So it's making rich medium and dark values of, of some quite soft colours. That's a really interesting dark, dark mauve colour. No idea how I'd match that otherwise. And then let's try it with a really light, delicate colour, so lemon yellow. I want to see what kind of effect it's going to have in this mix. So there we go, nice lovely flat lemon yellow. A uh, tiny bit of the blue again, let's see what happens. Gosh, that's really pretty. That's lovely, there's a tiny smudge of pink in there, but I don't think it's doing too much damage. Try a little more blue. Really nice, delicate aqua colours. I could really see that in the shallows on a white sand beach or maybe pebbles at the side of a stream. You know, it's just a really nice water, watery colour, the effect of looking through water with sunlight there. I've chased that colour many a time. Uh, really beautiful, nice mixture, very usable. Not too clean and artificial looking, but I mean, it's not really a foliage green, is it? But it's a very lovely, soft, usable, sagey aqua colour. And then let's see how bright it will go with a vivid yellow, like a bright yellow lake here. So I'm going to put out plenty of bright yellow lake and start carefully at one end with some blue. So that's made a really strong bottle green. Possibly a little too saturated for paintings of nature. Um, but if I take more yellow into it, where does it go? That's actually a really good spring green, sort of backlit foliage green. And that I could use straight onto a painting, I think, without having to soften it. It's eating the yellow, of course, I'm trying really hard to get a bright yellow green and it's all just coming out kind of mid green. And with a bit more blue, what do we get? That's moving to more of a sort of peacock green colour, again hugely intense and dark. Um, yeah, it's interesting, it's not as, that green is not as vivid um, as a thalo would be. You know, if I'd mixed that with thalo blue, 
I would get a similar green, but it would be a lot more vivid. Um, whereas these just have a kind of slightly more natural, softer edge to them. I'm having to spread everything really thin to try and show you the colour because of its intensity. And now uh, I, I thought I'd just try with quinacridone gold to see what kind of tertiary soft green we might get. Um, so that's definitely too much blue. <laughs> I'll just take a little bit in there. And again, these near blacks, as soon as I'm putting it with other transparent colours, it's just making colourful blacks really. Uh, but if I spread them thinly, that's got a great luminosity to it. And that's a really rich olive green I've got there. If I try a bit of lemon yellow there, you should be able to see what we've got. It's a really nice earthy, gentle green actually. Once I put something opaque into it, it's almost terra vert territory. Not as blue green actually, but that's a really interesting blue. And I can see that it totally fills a gap in the palette, if you like, for a lower saturation, very black, red biased blue, I would say. It's not very reddish, it's not really a purple blue, but it's definitely redder than Prussian or Thalo. So yeah, an interesting new character.